Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Uh, really appreciate you all sticking around for the, the non-fire fireside chat. Um, my name is Scott Clark. I'm co-founder and CEO of SIGOPT. SIGOPT's mission is to help empower your researchers. We do this by amplifying and accelerating the impact they're able to provide via our optimization platform. So we're an API that bolts on top of your machine learning, uh, trading, or simulations. And we optimize all the different configuration parameters, allowing you to get to better results faster and cheaper than standard techniques. Uh, I'm joined today by Matt Greenwood, the Chief Innovation Officer of Two Sigma. Um, and I'd love to have you maybe dive a little bit deeper into what Two Sigma does, um, how modeling affects it, and your role there. Testing. Great. Uh, well, thanks for having me here. Um, I love the fireside. Usually it's a kind of a single malt scotch on the rocks. Can I, can I get the single malt or is it too early? Could, we could 100% make that happen if you want it. <laughs> okay, great. We have the anti-fire here. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thanks for having me here. For Two Sigma, for those of you who don't know, we are essentially a small investment manager uh, in Soho. Uh, so uh, maybe not quite. Let me try a broad answer. Two Sigma essentially is a technology company that applies insights from big data in a scientific fashion to a broad range of investment businesses. And so we began almost 20 years ago with our hedge fund products, and we now apply those insights to asset management, market making, venture investing, and most recently, the insurance business. So there's a lot going on at Two Sigma, and we're hiring, uh, in case anyone here is looking. Um, and uh, what do I do at Two Sigma? I am the Chief Innovation Officer, and amongst other things, my role is innovating and driving the core platform that our modelers use to initiate, create, test, and then publish their ideas to the system. Excellent, thank you. So maybe could you dive a little bit deeper into how modeling or machine learning, in particular modeling more generally, affects some of these different lines of business you have at Two Sigma? Sure. Well. Really, models are Two Sigma's business. Everything that we do is a model. That's really all there is. So when I'm uh, you know, in my kind of day-to-day -day work, I tend to reflect on Box's uh, famous quote, all models are wrong, some models are useful, right? So that's frequently on my mind. We, we really think deeply about it. Models are really core to our ability to navigate through everything that we do. And at Two Sigma, we believe that models are useful primarily for three reasons. Firstly, if you have a model of something, whether it's uh, trading uh, in the stock market or you know, how you hire individuals or how you tune your JVM, they provide everyone talking about that model with a common frame of reference and within that frame, a common language. So when we are, that means that when we're observing what's expected by the model, our conversations can be shorter, they can be richer and more meaningful. And secondly, they allow us to test our hypotheses, right? So that's what a model is. And by paying careful attention to that gray zone where what the model does falls short of what we expect it to do, we understand more about the model that we're trying to build. And thirdly, of course, they provide us with a platform where we can methodically increase our understanding of the problem that we're trying to solve, and that's what we're trying to do all the time. That's excellent. And I know you mentioned a few applications there, but can you maybe dive one layer deeper into some of the specific applications you guys use for them today, and maybe how that's evolved over time? Sure. Well, like I said, we're a platform company, and really every single part of the platform that we build has its own set of models. So let me kind of briefly walk through a few of them. So our engineering systems, for example, really rely on models for things like capacity planning, resource allocation. We've open sourced uh, a couple of years ago our Cook scheduler that sits on top of Mesos for system tuning, for example, for simulation memory settings. In recruiting, we want to use these kind of models to understand how effective our process is, how we can do better. And we use models to help understand our employee growth because at Two Sigma, it's really the people that drive the business. And of course, in our core business, we use models extensively, whether it's for data ingestion and cleaning, for asset forecasting, portfolio construction, trading, execution. And of course, every model has its own set of parameters that has to be optimal. That's a great lead in there. Um, so can you talk to me about some of the impact that you've seen these have over time? Um, and obviously, like you said, 
uh, all models are incorrect, but some are useful. Like, can you talk to me about some of that business impact and usefulness um, and some of the top priorities to get that better over time? Sure. So I think that really the key idea that we have at Two Sigma is that we really think very deeply. We think very hard about the problems that we have and the platforms and the models that we build to solve those problems. And there are a few corollaries there. So firstly, as you learn from your mistakes or your misperceptions, your models become ever more sophisticated and the platform grows deeper and broader and easier to use as a result. Over the years, that's led us to create, for example, many languages for expressing time series modeling, domain-specific languages to allow our modelers to better express themselves, along with some large collection of simulators for actually evaluating our models. And really a cornerstone of our engineering philosophy is to provide what we call a conversational research platform for all aspects that we have of modeling. That's excellent. And so you talked a, a bit about complexity there, how these are getting more sophisticated over time. Uh, you mentioned briefly the, the sheer number of parameters that tend to creep into these models as they get bigger and, and better and better. Um, so how important is it to make sure that those configurations are correct in terms of amplifying that impact? Yeah, so I think the short answer is it's very important. It's really the difference between P and L, right? <laughs> uh, a model is only really as good as the parameters that are attuned by it. Now, the truth is that without, without the uh, model, there's no need for parameter tuning. So it's a kind of a a yin-yang, a kind of, you know, push-me-pull-you type effect. Um, but really, the people that we hire model, and they have an idea, a hypothesis that they want to test, and we want to try and find the parameters that really allow that hypothesis to bear itself out in the market or for whatever system we're doing. And so it's really, really critical that we find good ways to tune our hyperparameters on the one hand. On the other hand, I don't really want my modelers spending a week and a half running grid simulations to figure out what the best parameters are. So it's really a, a catch-22 there. That's excellent. So you talked about some of the time constraints in order to do this in an effective way, because obviously if you're trying to continuously innovate, um, you don't necessarily want to stop for a month and wait for a grid search to finish or something like that. So can you talk to me a little bit about some of the challenges associated with uh, making this more iterative, making this uh, more effective in your stack? Yeah, so, you know, uh, we, 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 we try to build a platform on the one hand. On the other hand, we really want to give freedom for our modelers to experiment with anything. And so the, the tension on the one hand is providing our modelers with what we know are good, clean, you know, uh, uh, algorithms that converge to do whatever we need to do, in this case, perhaps the tune models. Uh, and on the other hand, allow them to experiment with the plethora of you know, open source or other kind of tooling that there is out there for doing these things. And so really the key, the key thing for us is to kind of pick the, what we believe are kind of best of breed, to pull them into our platform, to offer that as the common platform for everyone, whilst allowing all of our modelers to at the same time experiment with the ideas that they might have. That's excellent. So how do you make that decision? Obviously, you have an incredible number of uh, quants and researchers, uh, and obviously more and more all the time as they're hiring. But uh, how do you make that decision between building something in-house, leveraging open source, buying a, a solution that, that can kind of bolt on and make immediate impact? Well, it, it may shock you, but we have a model. <laughs> excellent. Uh, we... we, we pay very careful attention to what our modelers are actually doing without really understanding exactly what they're doing, right? That's kind of part of the business. But all of the tools that we provide, whether they're part of the platform or they're standalone tools, uh, we track, we have a look at usage, and we understand, we predict usage, and we kind of have an understanding of when kind of some, some tool that some subset or some large portion of modelers are using kind of tips the boundary, and at that point, it's good to pull that into the platform and make it much more usable to drive adoption further. That's excellent. This is why Matt and I get along so well, is there's always a meta-optimization problem. Models on models, hyperparameters for parameters, the, the, the whole way, there's always something one level deeper. So can you maybe walk me through, historically, you mentioned grid search before, um, and, and maybe in-house solutions or open source, but just like what historically um, was the, the, the 
parameter optimization journey at Two Sigma. Yeah, so that's, that's not a joke about my age, right? We're, so I, it's, it's a tough crowd here today. So I, I've been at Two Sigma about 15 years, and we, we definitely have a lot of history. We've been doing this for a long time. I'm not sure those of you in the audience were here in 2003, but it was a very different world. There was no cloud, kind of cluster computing was all the rage, but it was very hard, right, for anyone who remembers kind of CJVM and the, the kind of stuff that was going on at the time. Python was fairly small, no pandas, a little bit of SciPy and NumPy, but really not much. And most of what we needed, we had to build on our own. And so, yeah, grid search, hey, it's pretty good. In 2003, it's very good, actually. Uh, we built, we used grid search, slightly smarter versions of it. It was kind of fairly standard, maybe even coordinate descent. But eventually, we kind of learned, we introspected, we graduated to a whole host of these kind of metaheuristic algorithms like genetic algorithms, CMAES, ACO, and you know, all the various uh, different flavors of that. We experimented with Bayesian optimization and other older techniques like Nell de Mead. But I guess that the key point was that we approached all of this kind of thoughtfully, intentionally, carefully, and at the limit of our platform, right? Not all of these algorithms are suitable on a small platform. You have to kind of grow your ability to compute, for example, to do something like Nell de Mead appropriately. Yeah, that's great. And so uh, did you see any sort of burden in, in upkeeping these models? And uh, you mentioned that there's a wide variety of different techniques. And obviously, there's the, the famous no free lunch theorem in computer science. So having one algorithm kind of solve them all is very difficult unless you can build up kind of an ensemble of many different approaches. So as you were solving this kind of modeling on top of modeling on top of modeling problem, um, was there any sort of like challenges or barriers to uh, achieving what you really needed to out of it? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think so. A, a proper delineation will probably take more time than we have for this uh, fireside chat. Um, but I, I think, you know, key to, key to two sigma and everything we do is an understanding that, you know, everyone is different, but we work together. And that's kind of embedded in the business that we have. We, we talk about portfolios of companies, and at Two Sigma, we talk about, talk about portfolios of talent, and portfolio optimization is a, is a you know, well-known thing in the industry. And so the, the idea of having multiple models or multiple algorithms that will uh, tune those models is not uncommon. It's kind of built into the DNA of who we are. But as you say, there's no free lunch, right? All of these have to be looked after, right? Code rots. Uh, Languages come in and out of favor, implementations change, and things that you thought were right five years ago uh, were, are no longer right now. Um, and so there is definitely the overheaded burden of um, having these algorithms in-house. And one of the things that I have to do continuously as kind of head of this platform is to think really about where I want to put my resources. Do I want to put my development resources in, um, in kind of looking after these kind of tuning algorithms, which are, are very important, but are peripherals, essentially, to the business that we have at hand, or do I want to spend more time really building core platform to allow my modelers to express themselves further? That's excellent. So once you adopted kind of a more scalable, standardized approach and took this arduous task off your plate, how has that affected just development in general at Two Sigma? Yeah, so as I said earlier, really, it's all about what we call conversational research. And you know, many people think that when we talk about conversational research, it's about speed. Um, and you know, to a certain extent, that's true. Uh, I love listening, listening to podcasts. At 1.0, it's a pain to get to All right, this one works. Oh, I sound better on this microphone than that one. Uh, uh, you know, 1.0, a podcast is kind of boring. At 5.0, it's not understandable. So there's this kind of happy medium where you can increase the speed to the point where you're getting good information. And that's really what conversational research is about. It's about driving the richness of, uh, of conversation. So if we can offload some of the kind of cognitive load that our modelers have when they're thinking about the whole um, life cycle of a model that includes tuning and refitting and things like that, and let them instead focus on the core real va economic value of the model, then that's going to kind of raise productivity and eventually drive more models to production. Nice. So instead of just models getting better uh, configured, it's also driving this ability to innovate faster and 
Have, have there been any other kind of interesting impacts on the business or kind of tertiary effects by kind of picking these best in, cl in class uh, tools and applying it so that you can get back to your core focus? Yeah, I, I think so. I think, you know, what, what, what happens is that you kind of drive people to think about uh, smaller pieces of the problem that are just, m they become much, much more effective at solving those pieces of the problem rather than thinking about everything that they have to do. Um, and so, you know, we really develop expertise in parts of modeling that we would never have developed if, we, if e every time we had to kind of solve the whole modeling problem. And then has there any been kind of any opportunities for the larger business? I know you mentioned before back in 2003, grid search or kind of parameter sweeps could make sense. And obviously, if you're tuning a random forest and there's maybe only two parameters, that can make sense. But has this been able to unlock any new opportunities? Because obviously, two-dimensional optimization in your head is hard enough. 15-dimensional optimization in your head is impossible. I, I would posit that n not any, even anyone in this intelligent audience here would be able to do that very effectively. So um, has it allowed you to maybe tackle broader problems or different problems than you had historically? Uh, yeah, there's, I think there's, there's no question. I, I, I think this is, this is key to being a platform company is that as you build parts of the platform, you allow yourself to kind of solve problems that you couldn't even envision with the, with the kind of the platform that you had five years ago. And that's exactly the same with all these algorithms, especially now in the age of AI, you know, the number of tunable parameters really goes through the roof. Uh, you know, it may be one for linear regression, and if you're doing neural networks, it's a lot, lot, lot more. And, you know, really getting a hand on understanding how to tune those uh, uh, parameters is absolutely key. Um, because really, I, you know, I think that especially in our business, um, those parameters are, you know, somewhat directly correlated with the risk that you're going to take on any one of these models. And really, in this game, it's just about understanding your risk. So the better you can kind of rely on those algorithms to tune effectively, um, the better handle you're going to have on your risk. That's excellent. How do you imagine this kind of continuing to evolve over time? Obviously, we've come quite a ways in the last 15 years. Um, you're in the business of predicting the future, but uh, what do you think the next five years uh, holds for modeling in general, um, and especially for some of the people in the audience today who might be just starting out on that journey? Um, what do you think about what the future holds? So, uh, yeah, I like to forecast rather than predict. It's kind of, it's, it's like the weather. I'm never quite Fair sure enough. what's coming down the road. The, mo the model's always wrong. <laughs> You know, I, I think 15 years ago, I would never have imagined that we are where we are. I think uh, this business has a huge challenge ahead of it uh, in terms of AI and uh, in particular deep learning. And uh, my colleague, Mike, sitting in the front row, will talk about that later um, a little bit. But I, you know, I, I think there are really open questions about how far you can, let's call it, let's find the best word, safely uh, drive AI into finance. Look, at the end of the day, this industry is really fairly desperate for a good, um, you know, a, a good way of understanding. Um, most people spend more time thinking about their vacation than they do about their retirement, which is kind of all their money, which is kind of shocking. And what we do at Two Sigma is we bring to the table the best of science so that those people who are investing in us can actually do what they do best, whether it's a pension fund or uh, an endowment or, or something like that. And obviously, you mentioned that uh, modeling is super pervasive at Two Sigma. Are there any specific applications where you wish you could apply modeling um, and that you haven't yet today? That maybe now with all this free time that your modelers have because they're not tuning hyperparameters, hopefully they'll be able to attack? Ooh, I think that's a hard question. I, I think that for me personally, uh, watching Two Sigma grow from just a handful of people when I arrived to almost 1,500 today and I have no idea where we're going in 15 years. Uh, one of the things that I would like best to understand is how, how companies evolve in terms of human beings and how we can best deploy our human resources for the best effects. And that clearly demands a lot of modeling and a huge amount of data that we're really just beginning to understand. And so I, that's a challenge that I think uh, is ever prevalent. That's excellent. And maybe a, a fun one before the break here. Uh, can you tell us your, your favorite fictional AI or uh, sci-fi movie? That was, that was meant to be question number two. That was the icebreaker, Scott. I, we started the icebreaker with the fire and the scotch, uh, so we end, end with something good here. So uh, I, 
just between us, I, I, I'm not sure how many people are, are, are here, but just, just between us, I'm not really a sci-fi guy. I'm a kind of a rom-com kind of guy. Um, but... Uh, Some, I, sometimes they overlap. Have you seen her yet? The, <laughs> too, too uncanny valley for me. Um, but I think, you know, one of the best movies that I've seen that really touched me uh, was a couple of years ago. There was a movie called Robot and Frank, uh, about with uh, Frank Langella actually about a uh, an older person older gentleman whose son buys him a robot to kind of help him around the house He is a cat burglar and teaches the robot to pick locks and they go on heists And it's a very interesting interplay between kind of human and robot and kind of this human and AI that I think we are just now really becoming really aware of and we're gonna have to grapple with you know, not just in finance, but society in general. So that, that was one of the uh, movies I've seen recently that's uh, fair. That's good. excellent. And that ties back to your point earlier about kind of augmenting what humans are good at and uh, uh, automating certain aspects of the stack, um, like maybe parameter tuning, but really allowing a human to uh, do whatever it is that they do best, whether that's uh, forecasting or whether that's uh, cat burglaring. And that's really what SIGOPT uh, is all about, is really augmenting your AI stacks. Um, we bolt on top of any infrastructure, model, or data pipeline. Um, we're not trying to automate everything away. What we're trying to do is take what you do best and accelerate your ability to iterate on it and amplify the results that come out of it. So if any of you have any questions about this, we're in the booth in the corner there, right, where it says accelerate and optimize. And uh, we'd love to chat with you about how we've worked with uh, firms like Two Sigma or other firms uh, in the financial industry space. Um, thank you all for your time. Thanks very much. Thanks, Thank Matt. you, Matt and Scott.